in a world a long time ago, when the Earth was still ruled by the dinosaurs. An asteroid 10 kilometers wide was set on a collision course with the planet. With their survival at stake, they had no chance to fight back. But now, 65 million years later, mankind gets ready for the most thrill ride science video ever seen. Meteorites under the scanning electron microscope. Hello, my name is Maidon. And I'm Hella Maidon. More than 100 tons of dust and sunside particles bombard our planet each day. But once in a while, a big one comes along and threatens our very existence. But what are meteorites actually made of and how do you even measure their composition? In order to answer these questions, we will demonstrate how a real meteorite is studied in a laboratory under the scanning electron microscope by using energy dispersive X-ray microanalysis. For that purpose, we need to investigate both the surface and the interior of our sample. So, let's get started. The meteorite has a metallic appearance and therefore it should be safe to clean it from contamination with deionized water and organic solvents. Finally, the sample is attached to a mushroom shaped holder with a carbon tape and inserted into the microscope. Now that the meteorite is back in its natural environment of vacuum, similarly to space, we can take a closer look at its surface. Already at the first glance we notice that the surface is covered with peculiar topographic features and each part of the meteorite appears to be completely unique. There are valleys of cracks that penetrate deep into the material, but also gorgeous forests of crystals, unlike anything seen on our planet. When studying one of these sites in more detail, we found something that should not be there. This microscopic structure clearly resembles a duck. How cool is that? For us, it is clear that such fantastic features could only have been created during extreme conditions, when the meteorite entered the Earth's atmosphere at an incredible velocity. Fascinating! How do we measure the composition of the sample? For that purpose, we need to study the interior of the meteorite, which was not oxidized or otherwise contaminated during the atmospheric entry. This can be done by drowning the sample in a vacuum epoxy and cutting it precisely to expose its interior. To measure the elemental composition of the meteorite, we need to bombard it with electrons that have sufficient energy to knock out electrons from the sample atoms. During the relaxation of these excited atoms, characteristic X-rays are emitted, and by measuring their energy and intensity, we get to know about the elemental composition of our substrate. As you can see, our current sample is metallic, and consists mostly of iron and nickel, which means that it is a fairly common meteorite. To our big surprise, the analysis program also shows a small amount of iridium. If this is true, then our sample may indeed be a smaller cousin of the asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs 65 to 66 million years ago, as that asteroid also happened to contain iridium, which is normally fairly rare on the planet Earth. Unfortunately, this was not the case as a more precise measurement with wavelength dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy showed that instead of iridium, we have small amount of gallium in our meteorite. But this is also awesome, as gallium is used as a source for the very same ion gun that is attached to our scanning electron microscope and regularly used to study the interior of samples. The reason why the two methods gave slightly different results can be explained as follows. Energy dispersive X-ray microanalysis with a scanning electron microscope is ideal for fast localized analysis in a microscopic scale, even for mapping the distribution of elements. However, since the peaks are broad and often overlap, the measurement of low quantities is problematic. In the case of wavelength dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, on the other hand, 
the sample is irradiated with X-rays instead of electrons and the resulting characteristic X-rays are collected from a larger area. Measurement with this technique can take a while as the spectrum is recorded by moving the analysis crystal and the detector. This allows to measure the intensity of the signal at each wavelength individually, and as a result the peaks in the spectrum are narrower, making the elemental analysis more precise. There is one final question to be answered. Why do some meteorites even contain a higher amount of heavier elements? In order to answer this question, we must travel back in time, when the solar system was still young and ruled by violent collisions. As matter came together to form larger objects, their mass gradually increased. These objects were also quite hot and molten, since the kinetic energy of the impacts was converted into heat. This allowed heavier elements like iron, nickel and iridium to sink into the middle while lighter elements like silicon, aluminium and oxygen move to the outer parts. As time passed, these larger objects cooled down and became solid. If such solidified objects were later broken apart by the gravity of nearby planets or due to collisions with other objects, then some parts that originated from the middle would naturally have a higher content of heavier elements and eventually find their way to our planet. So that's how scientists study a meteorite under the scanning electron microscope. All of the microscope images are available in our gallery, so be sure to check them out. If you have questions about this topic or have ideas for future episodes, then let us know by writing your thoughts to the comment section below. Bye. Bye.